I'm gonna try and get some good shots, so make sure y'all get me some promo pictures in there. There is so much good stuff on Netflix these days, to the point that it is often hard to pick out particularly good content to check out. That being said, a lot of you have seemingly already found a great docu-series on there. Specifically, Tiger King, Murder, Mayhem, and Madness. And with all of the insanity that the series puts in front of the camera, there's even more craziness that we didn't see, or that was only lightly touched upon by the documentary film crew. Luckily, that's where I come in, bringing you the facts, covering little details that you might have missed about the series. However, it should be noted that while I talk about these things, I am going to be spoiling the snot out of the series. So if you have any interest at all in watching it, go do that right now. With that out of the way, let's dive right into talking about this. You are money, my sexy tiger. So there has been a pretty serious update since the series was done filming. Despite being behind bars for the next two decades or so, Joseph Maldonado Passage, also known as Joe Exotic, has officially filed a lawsuit against his former partner. Jeff Lowe. In addition to the United States Department of the Interior, the U.S. Federal Wildlife Service, and some of the people that we see in the series. Basically, he is suing for perjury, false imprisonment, violating his civil rights, a lot of stuff like that. Basically, everything that he says at the end of the series, that's what he's suing about. He believes that federal agents and all of the people named in the suit specifically targeted him and ignored the truth to get him and only him put behind bars. Now, one thing that the series doesn't touch upon really is how exactly a man like Joe Exotic can come into possession of an entire menagerie of tigers. Like, how exactly does one buy a zoo? During the 1990s, Exotic purchased a horse farm near Winnawood, Oklahoma. After a while, he came into possession of his first big cats and converted the farm into the GW Zoo. And in those early years, Exotic used the horses that he originally had, and any that were donated to his facility, to feed the big cats. Which were probably a bit tastier than some expired Walmart meat. The series does spend quite a bit of time talking about Joe Exotic's political aspirations. But one thing that it doesn't really talk about is just exactly how many votes he managed to pull in. Spoiler alert, it wasn't very many. Let's start off with his presidential campaign back in 2016, where Exotic ran as an independent and was able to get on the ballot in Colorado, of all places. Of the over 118 million votes that were cast in the 2016 election, Joe Exotic managed to pull in a whopping 962 votes, including write-ins. That's not a lot. And as far as the governor's race in 2018, well, that one was a little bit better ratio-wise, but it was still only 664 total votes. So, yeah, maybe not the best career path for Exotic to try to go down. You know what else might not have been a great career move for Joe Exotic? Becoming a country music artist. Actually, that at least made him money as opposed to costing him money like the political aspirations. But you've gotta wonder if he actually wrote and performed the songs himself. Well, reportedly, Exotic lip syncs to someone else's voice, only really playing the part of a country music star. Which wouldn't really surprise me, to be honest. Now let's take a little bit of a break from talking about Exotic and instead talk about the people around him. Starting with his former producer and the guy who was trying to get the Tiger King reality show off the ground in the first place, Rick Kirkham. Kirkham was a reporter for the show Inside Edition, but during that time, he also had a rather dark secret, as he had an extremely serious problem with drugs. This secret became the focus of a documentary entitled TV Junkie, which included video diary footage from when Kirkham was 14 up to the present day. Sadly, the documentary wasn't super well received, but if you're interested in checking it out, it might actually be worth your while. Okay, let's shift over to the man that took over the GW Zoo and gave Joe Exotic the boot. I'm talking about Jeff Lowe, the businessman with a bad side. Now, the series does spend a little bit of time talking about Lowe's past run-ins with the law, but it doesn't quite cover exactly how bad some of his legal troubles have been. We hear in the series that he beat and strangled his ex-wife, but he has also been brought up on charges several times of using animals for profit without proper permits and licensing, operating pay-to-play businesses and such, 
without proper authorization. So yeah, he doesn't really seem to be all too friendly to either people or animals. After watching Tiger King, you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, man, seeing tigers in Oklahoma is pretty crazy. That's something you'll never see where I live. Well, don't be so sure, since big cats are actually more common in the United States than you would think. According to the World Wildlife Fund, there are roughly 5,000 tigers living in the United States, with only about 6% of them living within zoos and other such facilities that are accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. The other 94% are either living in private collections or unaccredited facilities. So there is a chance that one of your neighbors could possibly have a tiger. But do you know where there actually aren't a lot of big cats? Out in the wild, you know, where the animals belong. According to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, there are only between 3,200 and 3,500 tigers currently living in the wild across the globe. That's not exactly a lot, especially when compared to the number of cats living in captivity around the world. There are actually more big cats in cages than out in the open. And that's a pretty tough pill to swallow if you really stop and think about it. One thing that gets mentioned a few times throughout the series is the Endangered Species Act. But what is it exactly? Passed in 1973, this is actually an act of Congress that was designed to protect animal species that were at the highest risk of becoming extinct due to the actions of human beings. Basically, it aims to stop us from completely wiping out a handful of specific species. And it also tries to help those species recover their numbers to the point that they no longer need to be protected by the act, which is a good way to go when you really think about it. In addition to the Endangered Species Act, there is also another act that is talked about during the series that is meant to help protect the animals, that being the Big Cat Public Safety Act. This act, known officially as H.R. 1380, was put before Congress back in 2019. It was meant to amend the Lacey Act in order to help protect more specific types of animals, namely big cats. Now, wait a second. What the heck is the Lacey Act? Well, the Lacey Act is a law that was passed back in 1900 that was designed to help conservation efforts by prohibiting the trade of wildlife, fish, and plants that had been acquired illegally in some way. I'm sure that pretty much everyone watching this video has at least heard of the organization known as People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, also known as PETA. But what does the group actually do? Founded back in March of 1980 by a pair of animal rights activists, PETA seeks to eliminate the abuse of animals in any way, such as being used for clothing, food, research, and even entertainment. So yeah, it's understandable why they would not be big fans of Joe Exotic. While PETA has a fairly noble goal, they have been the focus of quite a bit of controversy even within the world of animal rights activists. Some people say that the organization goes too far with their demonstrating and some of the other less than savory things that they have done, while others argue that they just don't go far enough. Either way, PETA has at the very least done a lot to raise awareness for the cause of animal rights, and love them or hate them, they aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Murder for hire, or contract killing as it is often referred to as, is something that happens pretty much all the time in the movies. But how common is it in reality? Now, while we don't have any official numbers, what we have does give us somewhat of a look at the realities of this specific type of crime. In Australia, it is reported that between 1989 and 2002, there were about 162 attempted or successful contract killings, which accounted for about 2% of the total number of homicides during that period. So okay, not super common, but what about the cost? Once again, in Australia, a study was done that found that the average cost of a hit was around $15,000. So yeah, 3,000 isn't exactly a lot of money in regards to this kind of job. Another thing that we see all the time in the movies, and actually see happen in the Tiger King docuseries, is someone working with the feds and becoming a confidential informant. Kind of makes me wonder though, what exactly does being an informant entail? Well, in reality, an informant is someone who usually either is contacted by law enforcement officials directly, or who comes forward themselves and provides information to said law enforcement agencies. Now, they aren't always undercover or confidential, like we see in Tiger King. 
Sometimes the individuals simply provide information and then go about their merry way. Others, though, are used in sting operations, wearing a wire like we see in movies and such. So them using one during the investigation into Joe Exotic isn't all too surprising, all things considered. One thing that you might have found surprising is the fact that the U.S. Federal Wildlife Service took part in the investigation. Sure, the FBI being involved in a murder-for-hire scheme makes sense. That's what we all expect. But the Wildlife Service? Well, the fact of the matter is that the United States Wildlife Service becomes involved whenever animals are concerned. Not to mention the fact that the Wildlife Service is specifically tasked with enforcing any laws involving animals and plants such as enforcing the Endangered Species Act. So all in all, them being there isn't really surprising in the slightest when you think about it. One thing that the series talks about quite a bit in the middle is the disappearance of Carol Baskin's late husband, Don Lewis. Now, I'm not gonna get into the accusations against Baskin, as that could be the subject of an entire video all on its own. Instead, let's talk about the process surrounding a missing persons investigation. Since we constantly hear about them in the media, but I don't think we ever really hear about what actually goes into them exactly. Basically, once someone is reported missing, the clock begins. One of the first things that law enforcement officials try to do is secure any possible evidence and interviews that they can within the first 48 hours. As after that, people's memory starts to fade a little bit. And as time goes on, leads become harder and harder to follow up on. One thing that sometimes causes people to go missing, and the reason that Carol Baskin argued might be the case with her late husband, is dementia, or more specifically, Alzheimer's. So what exactly are those? Well, according to the Alzheimer's Association, dementia is the broad term used to describe any disease or condition that is characterized by a decline in one's ability to recall memories, solve problems, speak, or really be able to utilize any thinking skills necessary to perform everyday tasks. These changes can often impair a person's ability to think straight, which can lead to them just sort of wandering off. Now let's get away from the heavy stuff for a second and talk about some of the more entertaining aspects that we see in the series. A couple of different times throughout the series, we see some footage from Joe Exotic's web show, showing him firing off some guns and somehow blowing up a bunch of different stuff. What he is using to do that is a substance known as Tannerite. Tannerite, if you're not aware, is a type of explosive that can actually be bought in certain locations across the United States. Different states do have different laws regarding it, obviously, but it can be done. The reason this is the case is largely twofold. For starters, it comes in two different components, so you need to mix it yourself. Secondly, it will not detonate on its own, and instead requires to be shot by a high-velocity round to go boom. Besides being something that is just meant to be fun, Tannerite is actually meant for a couple of different purposes. First is target marking. Alternatively, it is also used for commercial purposes, such as low-level blasting and special effects. Something that we hear about a few times later on in the series is how much Joe Exotic talks about selling a few big cats for, saying that he could get about 5,000 per cat. Does that seem a little bit low to anybody else? Well, that's actually not too cheap, all things considered, as it is reported that you can actually get a hold of a tiger for as cheap as 800 to 2,000 bucks. The real kicker here, though, is the cost of caring for and maintaining these big felines. And that's before we even really get into the cost of simply feeding one of the kitties. So, okay, how much can a tiger really eat? Well, I hope you're sitting down for this one, as an average full-grown tiger requires roughly 5,000 to 6,000 kcals per day, which equals out to about 10 to 15 pounds of meat. That's per cat. And considering that tigers can live for up to 20 years, that's a heck of a cost. Now that I have thoroughly crushed your hopes and dreams of being able to afford your own pet tiger, perhaps you would instead want to help with conservation efforts. You know, help save the kitties. Well, for starters, you can always check out the World Wildlife Fund, which can be found at worldwildlife.org. There's also the Wildlife Conservation Society, which can be found at wcs.org. Honestly, there are a lot of different organizations out there that seek to aid in protecting tigers and other such big cat species. Just be sure to do your own research on each organization before donating, so that way you can be certain of where exactly your money is going. 
Netflix's new docu-series Tiger King is just the kind of crazy distraction that the world needs right now. But now that we've gotten invested in Joe Exotic and the other colorful personalities involved in the show, what's next? The big cat drama is far from over. From the upcoming legal battle to what John Finley did about his teeth, we've got all the where are they now details about the cast of Tiger King. Carol Baskin wasn't too thrilled when she heard about Tiger King on Netflix. The owner of Big Cat Rescue actually posted a 3,000 word essay titled Refuting Netflix's Tiger King on her website in the post. Baskin claims that the documentary crew was supposed to be making the Big Cat version of Blackfish. Baskin hoped that the Big Cat documentary would have the same impact as the SeaWorld documentary and shed some light on the awful life the cats lead in roadside zoos. Baskin's husband also posted a video message on the Big Cat Rescue verified Facebook page, where he explains how the couple became involved with the documentary, echoing most of the same statements Baskin made in her essay. Other than expressing their concern about how they were portrayed in the dock, Baskin and her husband still run the Big Cat Rescue in Tampa, Florida. They upload images to their official Facebook account and videos to their YouTube channel often for all of the cool cats and kittens out there. As for Carol's ex-husband, Don, fans have been pretty vocal about thinking that Carol really did feed him to the tigers. But what does Carol have to say? Well, in her essay, she says that Tiger King has a segment devoted to suggesting, with lies and innuendos from people who are not credible, that I had a role in the disappearance of my husband Don in 1997. But we can definitely expect to hear more about Baskin and her late husband's disappearance in the future. Hillsborough County Sheriff Chad Cronister posted on Twitter asking anyone to come forward with more information on the case, hoping that interest in Tiger King could reignite the investigation. I still think that she deserves to sit in jail for killing her husband. As for Carol, the next time we see her on a TV show will likely be in the scripted Tiger King series that's in development for Netflix. Kate McKinnon is rumored to be taking on the role of the Big Cat Lady. The founder of the Institute for Greatly Endangered and Rare Species, or Tiger for short, was also pretty unhappy with how he was portrayed in the docu-series. Doc Antle took it upon himself to release a now-deleted statement on his Instagram account regarding the TV show. The post read, We are very disappointed that our facility was mentioned in the new Netflix series. We can only assume it's because Doc Antle has been such a high-profile wildlife personality for so many decades that his association would create more buzz. But Doc Doc's definitely not letting the documentary bring him down. His Instagram account has been as big as ever, and he's posted lots of photos of his animals, including people swimming with big cats and even this photo of a chimp giving a guy a medical exam. Yeah, it uh, sure seems like things are just business as usual for Doc Antle. If you have questions about how Joe's husband John Finley is doing after the doc, he's started his Facebook page titled The Truth About John Finley just to answer them. He runs the page along with his wife Stormy Sanders and uses it to post updates and announce appearances. And Finley has been getting a lot of attention and doing a lot of appearances. He spoke with TMZ, did an interview on David Spade's YouTube show, and appeared on different radio stations. Opportunities he used to talk about his most exciting news, his brand new set of teeth. What upset Finley the most about the documentary was that it didn't show his brand new set of chompers, which he got back in July 2019. Finley claims that they had plenty of footage with him with his new teeth, but decided not to air any of it, likely to sensationalize the story and make him into a more colorful character. But Finley's not letting the finer details get him down. He still loves cats, works as a welder, and says he's doing great now with his wife and all his newfound attention. The man who was counting on a reality show about Joe Exotic ended up being a part of a major docu-series instead, but he is definitely not raking in the fame and fortune. I'm just tired, very tired. Rick Kirkham doesn't seem upset about how the documentary portrayed him, but he's definitely downgraded his lifestyle a bit now that his reality show tanked. He's currently living a pretty low-key life. A Facebook page reportedly belonging to the producer shows him chilling around the world with his wife, Kristen Kirkham. According to an unverified Instagram account that seems to be the real Kirkham, he was last seen visiting Norway. And to be honest, he's probably still mourning the loss of all of his priceless documentary footage. Jeff Lowe and Lauren Lowe are still running Joe's Old Park, the GW Zoo, which they've renamed the Greater Winniewood Exotic Animal Park. Pictures of the couple, their guests, and the animals can frequently be seen on the facility's Facebook page. 
Jeff Lowe is one of the people happiest with how the docu-series turned out. A statement released on the Facebook page by Lowe reads, I will always believe that our biggest contribution to the animal kingdom was helping the feds take down monsters like Joe Exotic. To continue their plans for rehabilitating the state of zoos, the Lowe's have expressed their plan to open another one in Oklahoma later this year. The couple also shared a photo to the zoo's Instagram account to answer people's most burning question, is Hot Nanny still around? The answer is yes. With the Hot Nanny appearing alongside Jeff, Lauren, and the big cat in the image. But even the hottest nanny in the world can't distract fans from questioning the zoo's practices. The exotic park currently has a three-star rating on Yelp, with a lot of comments on the lackluster cleanliness and small cages for the animals. Kelsey Saf Safari was the zookeeper at GW Zoo who lost part of his arm when he stuck his hand in a tiger cage to close the door. Saf was adamant that the accident was entirely his fault, not the cat's. This was just another day for me um, to overcome. In an appearance on David Spade's late night show Lights Out, Saf offered an update on the tiger that took his arm, saying, It's not the tiger's fault on my end. You don't have to put it down. It wasn't put down. We just moved it off of the park. The tiger is now sitting pretty in an area of the park that's inaccessible to guests. Saf blames his lapse of judgment on getting distracted by doing the same routine day after day. But the accident hasn't scared Saf away from dangerous animals. On the contrary, he still worked at GW Zoo until 2018, but decided to leave because Joe was his main reason for working there. But Saf promises he still loves his tigers, even if he's had to move on. And for those wondering, Saf did confirm that Joe was wearing a paramedic coat during the tiger mauling incident, and he even claims Joe told him he used to be a paramedic. <laughs> we wish we had some footage from those days. Joshua Dial was Joe's campaign manager when the Oklahoma Zookeeper ran for president in 2016 and then governor in 2017. Dial was also the one who witnessed Joe's husband, Travis Maldonado, accidentally take his own life. In an interview with Oxygen.com, Dial said that he's been working on getting past the incident. I have tried to move on, and I have been successful so far. I was given a new life and second chance when I met my fiance. I have no desire to bring any of that pain into my life. Dial still lives in Oklahoma, but no longer runs political campaigns. Dial said of the incident, What I didn't know was how much it would take out of me, but despite the bad times he had while working with Joe Exotic, he still believes the 22-year prison sentence was excessive and that Joe was likely set up by someone. Dial also hasn't watched Tiger King and doesn't plan to anytime soon. And that's probably the last time I will ever see Joe Exotic. Joe Exotic's fourth husband, Dylan Passage, only appeared in the last couple of episodes of the documentary, but he is still in contact with his incarcerated husband. Passage has an active Instagram account, which features the last post he was ever tagged in by Joe from 2018. But there are actually zero pictures of the Tiger King on Dylan's Instagram, even though the couple claims that they're still married. Dylan does post a lot of animal pictures and images of him having fun with friends and enjoying the sunshine. There's even a video of him riding an elephant, with with Doc Antle, who Dylan also follows. Mario Dubrowi, the owner of the Zoological Wildlife Foundation of Miami, is pretty active on social media. He has both a company account and a personal account on Instagram, and he's often sharing animal-related updates. His company actually has more than a million followers. Despite his relaxed lifestyle, legal troubles for Tabrawi aren't completely over. Though he was released from prison back in 2001 after being convicted of racketeering, he's been going after the law lately to try and strip back regulations on exotic animal parks. If you want to know more about Tabrawi's star chimpanzee Limbani, then you can check out the zoo's page for updates on the famous ape. Or you can go to Limbani's personal Instagram account, where the chimp has over 600,000 followers and seems to be living the good life. So what about the star of the series, the Tiger King himself, Joe Exotic? Well, we already know that Joseph Maldonado Passage is currently serving his 22-year sentence in prison for allegedly planning a hit against his competition, Carol Baskin, but that might not be the end of things for Joe Exotic. The former zookeeper has a lot of people interested in his case thanks to Netflix. Rapper Cardi B even said in a tweet that she'd like to start a GoFundMe to help Joe get out of prison. But of course, Joe isn't waiting around to be saved. The legal battle isn't over yet, as Joe has reportedly filed a $94 million dollar lawsuit seeking civil damages from various government agencies. He's even requested a presidential pardon. 
While Joe isn't up to a whole lot in prison, his personal Instagram account is inactive but public, so we can all check out his many eccentric posts that ended just before he was locked up. The account even contains private messages from Jeff Lowe and details about Joe's political campaigns. And of course, it features a lot of animal photos taken at the GW Zoo. While the account only had 1,000 followers before the docuseries aired, Joe's now got himself more than 150,000 and climbing. We'll have to wait and see if Joe will get off on the charges, but if he does, he'll be coming back to a horde of fans eagerly awaiting the zookeeper, country, singer, politician's next move. The Netflix documentary Tiger King is full to the brim with a ton of wacky and interesting people. It really seems like the world of exotic animals just tends to attract those types of people. Among them is one person that is, honestly, sort of easy to forget about when someone like Joe Exotic is hamming it up on screen. I am of course talking about Dr. Bhagavan Antle or simply Doc Antle for short. While not as outwardly flamboyant or eccentric as exotic, Antle is certainly a character. And characters like him tend to fit right in in Hollywood, which is good because Antle has done some work on the silver screen. And in this video, we are gonna be taking a look at all of the major pieces of work that Doc Antle and his animals have been involved in. From musical appearances to other documentaries to beloved 90s comedies, these are some of the films that Doc Antle and his animals were involved in. Let's dive right into it. Been here 35 years. Heard it all forever. Let's start things out with perhaps the weirdest of all the projects that Antle was involved with. While not as big a deal as film appearances, Antle's animals every once in a while popped up in music videos back in the day, working with people like P. Diddy and Janet Jackson. There was one time though where we actually got to see Antle alongside one of his tigers, namely during the 2001 Video Music Awards on MTV, specifically during Britney Spears' performance of I'm a Slave for You. Take a look in the background there when Spears first comes out of the cage at the very beginning of the song. The tiger is pretty easy to spot, but if you look closely, you can actually see Antle sitting in there with it. Kind of a random place to find him. But hey, when Britney Spears asks you to help her out with a show, you say yes. When I talk about films that feature animals prominently, what is one of the first film franchises that pops into your mind? I was hoping you would say the Ace Ventura films with Jim Carrey that came out in the 90s. Most of the animals in the first film, Ace Ventura Pet Detective, were smaller in size, which makes sense, since the main location we see a lot of exotic animals is in Ace's apartment. Kinda hard to fit a tiger in there. However, Antle did work on this film, serving as the principal animal trainer. So I guess Antle is capable of handling a lot of different little critters. Speaking of Ace Ventura, Doc Antle also worked on the film's sequel, Ace Ventura When Nature Calls, a few years later, once again serving as the principal animal trainer. This film, being set out in the African wilds, naturally featured a lot more exotic animals, including several larger ones. However, despite being set in the wild, the place we see a tiger is actually at the monastery in Tibet. Can't say for sure if it's Antle's tiger or not, but come on, who else would they get one from? Anyone remember the movie Mighty Joe Young, the 1998 film starring Charlize Theron and Bill Paxton, about a giant mountain gorilla and the woman who takes care of him? Well, despite being an animal-focused flick, it actually didn't have a ton of animals in it, as all of the gorilla scenes were done via animatronics. However, there were a few scenes in the film that utilized real animals, though none featuring tigers. The animals that are there were largely tended to by Antle, however, who served as an animal trainer once again. The Notorious Betty Page may not seem like the kind of film that would have needed an animal tamer like Doc Antle, you know, being a film about a famous pinup model and all that. Anyways, despite being a biopic about a model, there was at least one sequence that called for Antle's work. That being one where we see Paige posing with a bunch of animals, including a pair of leopards, which aren't tigers, but hey, still big cats. Hoo boy! Here is a film that definitely needed some animal handling. Wild America was a 1997 adventure comedy film about three brothers who head out into the American wilds in search of rare animals to film for a documentary that they're trying to make. While there are no tigers in the movie, Doc Antle did work on the film as an animal coordinator and brought together a lot of different critters. 
from horses to bears to wolves, and even a lion at one point. Once again, sad to not see any of Antle's striped boys, but nice to see a big cat regardless. Okay, so it's been too long since we've seen any of Antle's tigers, and it's starting to make me just a little bit antsy. So let's talk about a movie where Antle's entire role on set was as the tiger trainer. I'm talking about 1994's The Jungle Book. You know, the first live action Disney remake of the iconic film. So basically, in this film, Antle worked with a few of his tigers to bring the monstrous, antagonistic beast Shere Khan to reality. Again though, I can't 100% say that the tigers used in this film are his, since there isn't exactly an IMDB for specific animal performers. But come on, it's gotta be his tigers. That would make the most sense. Now here is one that is really, really gonna make you scratch your head, just like it's currently making me do as I record this. The Jungle Book 2. Wait. Isn't The Jungle Book 2 an animated movie? A sequel to the original Disney film? Why would a movie like that need an animal trainer like Doc Antle? That is a good question, and is something that I actually can't say for sure. Some sources say that real animals, including tigers, were used as animation reference while others say that real animals were used for sound effects. Either way, Doc Antle is listed in the credits as an animal trainer. Just look, there he is on IMDb. Now, The Jungle Book 2 is also not the only Jungle Book sequel that Antle worked on. There was actually a smaller, non-Disney film in 1997 entitled The Second Jungle Book, Mowgli and Baloo, which Antle was credited for, once again, his role as a tiger trainer. Just like with the 1994 Disney live action flick, Antle was in charge of making sure that Shere Khan hit its marks exactly as the filmmakers required. The film itself wasn't exactly well received, but honestly, who could complain about seeing some awesome tiger acting? Here is yet another entry that doesn't quite fit in with the other ones on here. As this isn't a movie about someone hanging out in the jungle or some other exotic locale, surrounded by crazy awesome animals. This is one that is about a young boy growing up in Mississippi, The War from 1994. Doc Antle is once again listed as an animal trainer for this dramatic flick. Though this might be one of the tamest stables of animals on the entire list, with nothing really all that exotic standing out. Now let's take a very, very brief look at Antle's first flick, the 1990 superhero comedy film by Lloyd Kaufman and Troma Entertainment, Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD. This film follows a beat cop who gains the ability to transform into a kabuki theater performer who fights crime. Yeah, it's just about as weird as you're thinking right now. On this one, Antle actually got to add an extra word to his title being credited as not just any old animal trainer, but actually the head animal trainer. You know how you know when an animal trainer has really hit the big time? When they get on the late night TV show circuit, and Doc Antle certainly did just that, appearing on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno twice in 2001 and 2002, respectively. And this is something that Antle actually did mention in Tiger King when he stated that Leno helped bring mainstream awareness to the plight of big cats and endangered species alike, which might actually be pretty accurate. The more and more people who get to see these beautiful animals, the more people are likely to care about them. Speaking of Tiger King, the Netflix docuseries is not the first documentary that Doc Antle has been involved with. Not even close, actually. One such documentary is When Animals Adopt, where Antle appeared as a representative of the Tigers Preservation Station, showing off a few of his different animals, including tigers, obviously. Fun fact, Tigers Preservation Station is now just a part of Antle's Myrtle Beach Safari setup that we see in Tiger King. Even the world-famous National Geographic got some face time from Doc Antle. In the 2006 episode of National Geographic Explorer, entitled Ultimate Cat, Antle once again got to show off his feline companions and represented the Tigers Preservation Station, talking about how we need to act to save these beautiful creatures, which are actually some big words from a man who allegedly has run illegal pay-to-play schemes featuring tiger cubs. Allegedly. Outside of these projects, Antle has provided some animal-related work for a few different bits of media, including an ad campaign for Exxon called Put a Tiger in Your Tank, 
which reportedly is the job that first led him to learning how to train tigers. He also worked with the U.S. Postal Service to create a series of tiger-themed stamps back in 2011, proceeds from which went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which in turn allocated the money to a variety of different conservation projects. Beyond that, I can't actually speak to his claims of having worked on 500-plus Hollywood movies over the years. But either way, he has certainly done his fair share of work, alongside not only his tigers, but also many other species of animals. How many of the projects that Antle worked on have you seen? Do you know of any that I didn't mention? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and while you're down there, why not consider subscribing to Screen Rant for more awesome videos just like this each and every day. Thanks for watching, and stay safe out there.